The goal of this video is to draw an unexpected link between three more or less unrelated topics, and hopefully tie them together with a satisfying link to everyday life. Although being fairly maths heavy, it's my hope that by conveying the underlying reasoning and logic that governs these mechanisms, you can still grasp the connection between them, without much prior knowledge of the maths involved. The first topic of interest is one related to music, more specifically, musical melodies. Arguably the purest example of the musical melody arises in fugues, a compositional technique popular in the Baroque era, where many melodic phrases are layered on top of each other, underpinned by a recurring melody, sometimes called the subject. I find that music, and especially the fugue, are vaguely referred to as being mathematical in nature, although often with very little substantiation, especially for those not as familiar with music theory. It's my hope that this opening will provide some grounded reasoning for this link, as well as a deeper connection to an interesting branch of maths and physics. I first want to consider a fugue by J.S. Bach whose main melody or subject sounds like this. And I'll have the sheet music up if you feel like following along. Of course, Bach then goes on to craft a beautiful, almost eight minute long piece around this subject, which I would highly recommend checking out. However, in order to maintain a more mathematical outlook over things, I want to try visualizing this melody in a unique way. I'm going to set up an XY plane with both axes representing musical pitch, ranging across two octaves from C3 to C5. I want to plot the development of Bach's subject as points on this plane, so I'll place the first note of the piece as a value on the x-axis, a C4. The question now is, what pitch should the y-axis represent? Although it may seem unexpected at first, I want the y-axis to represent the musical note which will immediately follow the note described by the x-axis. So, while the x-coordinate of this point represents the first note of Bach's melody, the y-coordinate will represent the second note. I can do the same for the next note, adding a point whose x-coordinate now displays the second note of Bach's subject, and whose y-coordinate displays the third note. In a sense, the x-axis of this graph can be thought of as displaying the nth note of the melody, while the y-axis is displaying the nth plus one note. Now those of you who have ever worked with comparing some nth value with an nth plus one value might see where this is going, but nevertheless, we will continue by filling in our plot with all the remaining notes of the melody. Finally, as if playing a game of musical connect the dots, we can listen again to the subject of the fugue, while connecting our points in order with a continuous growing curve. I've displayed the sheet music once again if you want to follow along, and I encourage you to try interpreting how the evolution of the curve relates to the evolution of the melody. Granted, there's no part of Bach's fugue which says these points should relate to any particular curve. However, I find the general idea of representing this musical subject in such a unique visual way to be very engaging and hopefully somewhat illuminating if you're less familiar with musical analysis. Let's try this one more time with the next section of the fugue. In this section, Bach works with two distinct melodies one of them being the subject, which we just heard. 
However, this time beginning on a different note. The second, new melodic line, is known as the counter subject, a melody which complements the subject, adding interest and complexity. I've chosen to represent the subjects with the color blue and the counter subject with the color red. And before adding in our points, I'm going to extend the domain and range of our axes to accommodate for higher notes played in this section. I'll add the sheet music on the side again. And this time, see if you can follow both the subject and counter subject, both orally and visually, as they progress. Once again, a fascinating image emerges, this time made up of two distinct curves. This method of representing a musical piece graphically is covered in much more depth in a great paper by Jennifer Schaefer, where many more Bach fugues and inventions are analysed. Although undoubtedly a fascinating visual interpretation of music, these musical graphs could be easily dismissed as a fun, aesthetic novelty. However, and in a point which leads nicely to our next concept, composer and mathematician Charles Madden disagrees, stating, this random structure is a single orbit that will never repeat and should be understood as a strange attractor. That's a lot to take in. And the question arises, what does Madden mean by a strange attractor? Well, a strange attractor is defined as a mathematical object describing the long-term behaviour of a chaotic system. The most well-known strange attractor is undoubtedly the Lorentz attractor. Characterised by its butterfly-like form, it is described by a system of three ordinary differential equations and was first developed to model atmospheric convection. Now to someone without much experience with differential equations, these probably appear quite intimidating, and rightfully so. Even to the most seasoned mathematicians and physicists, differential equations are no joke. Before jumping into things, let's consider a simpler version of a system of differential equations, this time in only two dimensions, x and y. Essentially, what our equations hope to describe is how some arbitrary point's position in space, its x and y coordinates, will change as we move through time. To gain a foundational understanding of what this means, let's consider a method for approximating solutions to differential equations. In essence, and although not strictly correct, we can think of this dx dt term as a fraction, saying that over a very small time period dt, x will change by a very small distance dx, which in this case depends upon its y position and its x position. Let's choose some arbitrary starting position on an xy plane, 2, 3 for example. Now here's the trick. Give we know that dt represents a very small period of time, let's approximate it as a very small number. 0.5 for example. Given we're treating this first term dx dt as a fraction, let's multiply the denominator dt over to the other side of the equation. We're left with dx equals y minus x dt. We can calculate this value of dx by subbing our xy coordinates 2 3 into our new formula and remembering our choice to approximate dt as 0.5 sub this in as well. So we find that dx equals 0.5, and we can represent this with a vector of length 0.5 extending from our original point in the positive x direction. We can perform the same operation on the equation for dy dt to find how much our initial y value changes, and extend another vector representing this change, dy. Finally, the addition of our dx and dy vectors gives a good approximation for how our original point changes position over a small time increment, dt. 
The beauty of this method is that it can be repeated indefinitely, completing the same process for our new point, 2.52, we continue iterating this process, finding where our point lies after two iterations, three, and so on. After enough iterations, we can safely say that as t grows, the point xy will tend to zero, zero. This approximation is known as Euler's method for solving differential equations, and only gives an approximation for a single initial point over time. If we wanted to visualise how all possible points will change over time, we can create a vector field which assigns each point in space a velocity vector, indicating the instantaneous rate of change at that location. This is typically represented by placing arrows at regularly spaced positions on a plane. As we can see, this aligns very well with our approximation. It is important to note that a vector field like this could represent any number of systems which change through time, like wind or water flow. It might be helpful to visualise the paths of many individual starting points, giving a more tangible representation of what our differential equations are describing. Okay, after that short detour, let's return to the Lorentz attractor. In actuality, it behaves very similarly to the previous example. However, this time we've added a third dimension, as well as a few constants, where changing their values will adjust the shape of the attractor. The main difference between our previous example and the Lorentz attractor is the behavior of the system as t increases. In our previous example, no matter where we started from, the points eventually spiraled in and converged to the origin. However, the Lorentz attractor is different, seemingly continuing to grow indefinitely, bound by this unusual butterfly-like structure. And this turns out to be exactly the case. The Lorentz system, despite being bounded by this finite structure, will never pass through the same point twice, no matter how long you leave it running. The Lorentz attractor displays another unique trait, in that it is extremely sensitive to initial conditions. Let's choose two different starting points for the Lorentz attractor, separated by a very small distance, and set them running. Initially, the points follow very similar routes. However, after enough time, they diverge, taking completely different paths, and you could never tell that they began at practically the same position. There actually exists many more strange attractors beyond the Lorentz attractor. The Ayazawa attractor, Halvorsen attractor, and according to Charles Madden, the never repeating single orbits of our musical graphs from earlier. This is the type of chaotic system referenced in the definition of the strange attractor. The chaotic nature of strange attractor systems is the ultimate reason why we can't accurately predict the weather for more than a week in advance. If our measurements are off by even the tiniest of margins, the mathematical systems used for predictions will eventually diverge from their actual values. Historically, many have proposed the idea that, given enough computing power, the future could be accurately predicted indefinitely. One example is Laplace's demon, a hypothetical being who knows the exact positions and momenta of every particle in the universe, and who could therefore predict how our entire universe's future would play out. The motion of the planets, Earth's weather forecast, and the very activity within your brain. Laplace poetically describes, for such an intellect, nothing could be uncertain, and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. This deterministic outlook implies that the universe's future is already set, 
and could be predicted entirely by perfect measurements of its initial conditions. Unfortunately for Laplace, nearly a hundred years after his death in 1827, a new theory would emerge which rendered his all-knowing demon powerless. At the turn of the 20th century, Max Planck resolved the so-called ultraviolet catastrophe, sparking the birth of quantum mechanics. Light no longer worked along a continuous spectrum of energies and wavelengths, instead being restricted to small, discrete packages of energy, what we now call photons. This idea was furthered by Einstein in 1905, and eventually culminated in Erwin Schrödinger's wave equation in 1926, and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in 1927, which postulates that we can never accurately predict the development of a quantum system, and instead can only calculate the probability of an event occurring. Although displaying similar properties to our strange attractors from before, the unpredictability of quantum mechanics stems from a fundamentally probabilistic universe, whereas systems like the Lorentz attractor appear chaotic and unpredictable due to a sensitivity to initial conditions. However, when these two phenomena are interpreted together, a fascinating idea emerges. While hypothetical beings like Laplace's demon could precisely predict the evolution of a deterministic universe, it is fundamentally impossible to accurately predict quantum events, such as when a radioactive particle will decay, or the exact position and momentum of a quantum particle. Given just a single unaccounted for quantum event, the sensitivity to this tiny change will eventually spiral into a future unable to have ever been predicted all thanks to quantum mechanics and the sensitivity of chaotic systems to small changes. So, at the end of the day, along with the chaotic systems seen in the Lorentz attractor and in Bach's music, quantum events might be the key to a future which is entirely undetermined and unknowable, free for you to make your own lasting impact.